welcome back to the Paperback Warrior Podcast. It's time for another new episode. I'm your co-host, Eric, and we've got another great show planned today. Uh, last week, we delved into the literary world of Peter McCurtain. We received a lot of great comments, a lot of uh, uh, feedback on that particular feature. I'm glad Tom really delved into McCurtain's work. It was really interesting. Uh, it's dense subject matter considering the amount of books and, and series and really mystery regarding a lot of his uh, novels. So uh, let's uh, let's bring on my co-host Tom, who's going to tell us what we've got on tap for today. Okay, so today we're going to examine the noir work of successful author Richard Matheson, who's primarily known for his horror and science fiction work. We also have two reviews for you, as always. Uh, one of 1955's A Bullet for Cinderella by John D. MacDonald. And the other one by William W. Johnstone, his 1984 Western, The Last Mountain Man. But before we get started with that, uh, I want to address some uh, feedback. And this time I'm not going to be abusive at all because the feedback's coming from probably one of the most knowledgeable guys on planet Earth about the men's adventure genre. And if you can read the actual feedback, it was kind of a, almost a mini article in the comments of our review of Super Cop Joe Blaze number one, The Big Payoff. And the commenter is none other than Joe Kenny of the Glorious Trash blog at gloriousTrash.blogspot.com. A great, great blog that anybody who's a fan of this genre should be taking a look at. Anyway, and I'm not going to read Joe Kenny's entire uh, comment, um, but it was really insightful. And he makes the case, and I think he may have some validity here, that Super Cop Joe Blaze number 1 was not, in fact, written by Nelson DeMille, as we suspect. He makes the case that it was likely written by another author by the name of Paul Hoffrichter, who uh, we have reviewed his books before on the website Paperback Warrior, and he also wrote one of the books in the Soldier of Fortune series. I think it just goes toward kind of the the myth of the all anything Peter McCurtain touched. It was often difficult to tell who wrote what. Uh, Joe is actually probably better at contextual reading of a book where he can actually read a book and say, oh, this is the style of Len Levinson. This is the style of Peter McCurtain. This is the style of Don Pendleton. Much better than either Eric or I. So I think Joe may be on to something here. I'm not willing to wave the white flag and say we got it wrong because everyone's going to have a theory on this one. And But Joe's a smart guy, and if he says it's Paul Hoffrichter, it might be worth betting in that direction. Eric, uh, what else do we want to talk about before we get into it? Well, you're going to talk about uh, a really uh, a really cool author named Richard Matheson, and I'm not terribly familiar with Matheson. Did he write Did he write Hell House? Yeah, he did write Hell House. Okay, so that's really the only novel I've ever read by him, and I really, really enjoyed that one. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to hear this. Yeah, okay. go Anyway, so people know Richard Matheson um, as a horror writer primarily. He also wrote some science fiction and fantasy novels. I think his most famous work is uh, I Am Legend, which was uh, obviously made in the movie with Will Smith. But before that, it was a Charlton Heston movie called Omega Man. And uh, the book itself was a massive bestseller. He lived from 1926 to 2013, and he wrote 16 episodes of the original Twilight Zone series. His uh, short story, Duel, was made into Steven Spielberg's first film. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is that he also wrote at least three uh, books in the crime noir genre, including his very first crime now, uh, his very first novel, which is a noir book called Someone is Bleeding, which was published by Lion Books in 1953. In, um, his second novel was called Fury on Sunday in 1953, also a crime noir book. And he wrote a third one called Ride the Nightmare in 1959. These books are really hard to come by because Richard Matheson is one of these authors that's very collectible, particularly to people who are who collect original paperbacks from the 50s. And because of his success in the horror and the science fiction book, this is one of these guys who's actually a household name, very much kind of the Stephen King of his era. However, you are in luck because in 2005, a company called Forge Books re-released all three of these short crime novels in one volume, and it's called Noir, N-O-I-R, and it's released under Richard Matheson's name. So if you went online and read um, and looked for Noir on Amazon.com or used bookstores, uh, Kindle, and I believe they're also available on audiobook, uh, you can find uh, these three books under one title, and it's Noir. Let me run through the three books for you really quickly. Um, the first one uh, is The Best of the Bunch, and that was Someone is Bleeding. It was his first book, which is amazing because the book is great. Basically, this guy meets a hot chick on the beach, 
and it's clear very early to the reader, if not the uh, narrator, that this woman is just crazy as a loon. But he doesn't see it because he's so starry-eyed for this woman. Eventually, the bodies begin to pile up in their orbit. And the question is, is this girl Peggy killing these people or or not? It's just a fantastic novel of of fatal attraction. I I reviewed it on uh, the Paperback Warrior website. You can check it out in the archives. It's a terrific book. By all means, you should seek it out. The uh, second book was Fury on Sunday. And that was his, I think, second novel. And it was actually my least favorite of the noir trio. It's about a piano prodigy who basically escapes from a mental asylum to hunt down some sets of men and women with whom he has a history. It ends up devolving into this weird relationship drama. I would say it's a love triangle, but there were like several couples. It was like a love pentagon, I believe. And it lost my interest eventually. I think the writing was good, but the story was just too convoluted. Uh, the third book was called Ride the Nightmare. And uh, it's the third book in the noir, noir series. It was a adapted into an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. It's basically a home invasion story. A home invader breaks into a couple's home, and it becomes clear that this home invader was not choosing a random house. That the invader has a very specific score to settle with the husband. And it becomes clear that the husband hasn't been entirely honest with the wife about his own background and his own checkered past. And it's a very good suspense thriller. I'll say it wasn't as good as Someone is Bleeding, but it was still a good read and uh, and definitely worth checking out. As I said before, these books are available separate as e-books. They're available together as as noir. um, They're also available as e-books and audiobooks. I think it's fascinating when an author from a different genre jumps over to do something different. I also read and reviewed a book by Robert Block, uh, B-L-O-C-H, called The Kidnapper, which was written in the 1950s. It was originally released as a straight-up crime novel, and then it was um, repackaged in, I think, the 1980s with a more horror cover after uh, Robert Block became such a successful horror author. He's the guy who wrote Psycho. And man, was that a dark crime novel. But wow, it was terrific. Also available there. But I just think it's fascinating when like a horror author decides he wants to write a noir o- a book or when you know some Western author, author like uh, Clinton Adams um, decides he wants to write a crime novel. I just think it's fascinating when people jump genres and how good those books are. It's like they have this great germ of an idea as opposed to the people who just write nothing but one genre and then become a little mediocre in their own expertise. It's an odd phenomenon. Anyway, so let's uh, jump over. You have a review to share with us, don't you? Yeah, before I do that, I'm going to say that uh, according to uh, some research here, it says Ride the Nightmare was uh, adapted into a 1970 French-Italian movie called Cold Sweat, starring action extraordinaire Charles Bronson. Really? Okay. Interesting. So it was adapted both into uh, a movie and an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. So he got paid three times for this book. Yeah, that's right. And uh, doing a little bit more research on him, it says that uh, Stephen King dedicated his novel Cell to Richard Matheson. And that George Romero uh, sort of came up with the idea of Night of the Living Dead based on Matheson's uh, The Last Man on Earth, which of course was filmed as uh, I Am Legend. And uh, I guess gothic romance writer Anne Rice says that Matheson's story, A Dress of White Silk, was an influence on her interest in vampires altogether. Matheson wrote a World War II novel that I'm dying to read, uh, like something about bearded warriors. I can't remember the name of it, but I, I finally got a copy. I'm dying to read that. And he also wrote another book, uh, which very unhelpfully his name escapes me, that looks like it's very much a deliverance ripoff, but it's supposed to actually take the sadism and violence of deliverance and turn it up a notch. So those are two books that I want to read in the math. Yeah, I'm just sort of, I love Richard Matheson's writing, and I want to check out more of his non horror and non science fiction books. The Deliverance ripoff isn't uh, Hunter's Blood, is it? No, it's got a, it's got a complicated title. I can't a longer title. I can't recall the name of it. But listeners will let us know. <laughs> okay, good. Well, speaking of bearded warriors, we're going to move on to my uh, review this week, which is William W. Johnstone's The Last Mountain Man. Uh, William W. Johnstone was a really popular men's action adventure novelist. Uh, he wrote a ton of westerns, but he also contributed to the post apocalyptic uh, genre with this uh, long-running Out of the Ashes series. I can't remember how many installments there were, but there were a ton. Uh, He also wrote some 80s action novels like Rig Warrior 
and he wrote some horror as well, typically with the the word devil in front of it. Um, I think he had a fascination with evil cats too, which is kind of weird, but uh, he was born in 1938. He passed away in 2004. While his career wasn't that mysterious, uh, his when he when he died, I guess things got a little little strange. So he dies in 2004, but the family doesn't tell anyone. It's not until three years later that his death was officially confirmed after tons of rumors out there. I just think that's kind of weird. Uh, but since then, the family has created a successful and lucrative empire by launching uh, you know, dozens of these series based on characters that he created or continued on with the existing series that uh, he had created, or they made new titles you know, altogether, um, most of which have William's name on it or the initials J.A., um, so it's either William Johnstone or J.A. Johnstone. And I'm assuming J.A. Johnstone was a son or a grandson. Actually, I have news on that. J.A. Johnstone is Joanne Johnstone. It's his niece. Oh. And she basically is is managing the estate. I don't believe that she's a writer herself, but she is sort of the, I guess, the business person in the Johnstone empire now. Okay, yeah, I kind of figured that whoever J.A. Johnstone was didn't type a single word. Uh, but instead, the Johnstone Empire is pinned by a revolving team of authors who write anonymously. The whole thing is you know, the whole thing's really strange to me, but after all these years, you can still find new Johnstone books nearly every month at Walmart. Uh, the books cater to the older crowd, and I know my dad reads them nonstop, and he doesn't seem to care. He, well, he really doesn't seem to care or even know that uh, Johnstone isn't writing them. He just doesn't care. He's the most productive dead guy since L. Ron Hubbard, and... Uh I don't know if you were going to get into this, but the authors who were writing the Johnstone books have to sign non-disclosure agreements saying that they re- they will not ever tell who is writing them. Wow, that's really interesting. It's, it's the polar opposite of the way that the Pendleton estate um, handles the um, the Don Pendleton, Mac Bolin books. Mac, Pendleton really wanted people to know who was writing them and give the authors credit on the copyright page. You know, special thanks to Stephen Merch for writing this book. The Johnstone estate's the polar opposite of that. They go to great lengths making people sign non disclosure agreements, saying they they won't even tell their friends and family that they wrote these books. Yeah, and this thing is making cash like uh, you know the 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 Elvis dynasty. Um, there's so many books uh, you can find them everywhere, um, and it's just it's insane. But I don't want to go into William W. Johnstone too much because I think we're going to do a future uh, a future feature on him altogether. Uh, there's a lot of things to talk about with him. But uh, the Last Mountain Man uh, introduces his I guess really his most popular character, which is Smoke Jensen. Uh, Last Mountain Man was published by Zebra in 1984, and uh, it's still ongoing. I think I looked it up uh, earlier today. The Bloody Trail of the Mountain Man is installment number 47 and comes out later this year. Uh, The Last Mountain Man spawned another series about Preacher, who's a consistent character in the early Last Mountain Man installments. There's also a series dedicated to the Jensen family. And there was a prequel, I'm going to call it a prequel, uh, written in 2016 that's really kind of introduces us to um, the early, early uh, days of the Jensen family and how they, uh, how they fought in uh, the Civil War. Uh, I think that's sort of the gist of it. It's listed on the William W. Johnstone site, uh, I think, as uh, Last Mountain Man entry, or maybe it's Last Mountain Man number zero. I don't know, but... Uh, it's kind of interesting that they retconned a little bit on that. Uh, but the uh, debut introduces us to Smoke Jensen as a teenager. At the beginning of the book, he's working in the family farm in Missouri. But things are pretty bad for him. His mother passed away from an illness. His brother has been killed in the Civil War, which had just ended. Uh, his father, Emmett, who was also in the war, returns to the farm and finds that things really are uh, pretty grim. They have very little money. Uh, the farm isn't taking off, and the two of them really need uh, you know, a, fr- a fresh start. Uh, Emmett comes up with a terrible idea, um, absolutely horrible idea, of packing the horses and taking him and his son west into the mountains to create a new life. Emmett, uh, he, he, I'm not going to say anything here. I don't want to spoil it for you, but he's got a secret agenda for going west. The problem is that Emmett doesn't know anything about the rugged wilderness. You know, Smoke doesn't. He's a, a farm boy in Missouri. So they know nothing about the mountain man lifestyle. This is the 1860s. The West is still the Wild West. So after this uh, journey, uh, they find themselves kind of stuck in the Rockies with no skills. Uh, there's the Native Americans uh, fighting with them. Uh, so they've got to contend with that. 
um, and the um, you know the atmosphere of really just living off the land, which is difficult. So thankfully, this old mountain man named Preacher comes to their aid, and he trains them on how to hunt, trap, how to live off of the uh, off the land. In a uh, in a really cool scene in the book, uh, there's a skirmish with some Native Americans, and I guess it's sort of the the coming of age uh, story right here in a nutshell. Smoke fights the Native Americans with a uh, a Navy Colt cap and ball, which is an ancient uh, firearm to be using in a uh, in a firefight. But he does really well, and Preacher is immediately impressed. He knows that there's something really cool about this kid. Uh, he quickly upgrades Smoke to better firepower. And for reasons I'm not going to go into here, because I really want you to read this book and enjoy it, uh, Preacher and Smoke ride further into the West alone, uh, specifically to a town. From here on, the early books normally involve just Smoke with Preacher, um, but Preacher's really just appearing from time to time. He's not necessarily consuming the narrative of these books. He just pops in and out. But Preacher spends the winter with Smoke and teaches him more about fighting with his hands and feet, how to shoot straight, ride tall, and speak the truth. Uh, but the second half of the book is the quintessential coming of age story. Uh, Smoke meets this, uh, you know, he meets a young woman near the end of the book, and they have a baby, uh, with baby's name to Arthur. Preacher knows that Smoke has a family of his own, and he sort of just drifts off and, and kind of lets them live their life. But the, uh, the finale is, is fantastic. It's a violent, uh, western, uh, finale in Gunsmoke. Um, Preacher and Smoke are fighting the bad guys. Uh, in this town for a, a very specific reason. Uh, it's an absolute blast. Uh, there's a lot of things going on within the story um, that I just I don't want to reveal, but it's a, it's a classic Western. Uh, it's meant for Western fans. Uh, it spawns, you know, obviously a lot of books, but in terms of longevity, I only made it to Volume 7 before throwing in the towel. Everything I loved about this particular novel is just absolutely thrown away. Uh, and I don't know why, but... The idea of Smoke being a mountain man is pretty much over by, like, I don't know, I'd say book three or four. That that whole idea is over. Then it's just a typical Western. I mean, Smoke, he rides into town, he fights land barons, he fights bullies. It's literally the same story over and over with just different names. There's very little frontier exploration or any kind of wilderness survival stuff. It's just not what you would think of as a mountain man. It's just a cowboy story. And they're not very good after, uh, you know, the first three or four. There's really no reason to read any further, in my opinion. I know it's probably going to anger a lot of people who love this series, but I think it's just a, it's just cookie cutter after that. Um, I guess that's really it. Oh, I will say this, though. Uh, the original paperback version of this has this really gorgeous painting and... It's outrageously expensive. I've tried to get a copy of it. My dad used to have one, but it's kind of been lost along the way. But I've looked for it. It's really expensive. I've never seen one in the wild. But most of Johnson's books in the series were reprinted with some of the worst covers you can ever imagine. I mean, there are these dull, lifeless black and white photos of, I don't know, uh, cowboys or trains or railroad tracks or something utterly stupid. And I fought the publisher for this. The publisher makes zillions of dollars off these things, and they won't spend a dime on any of the covers. It really is sickening. But anyway, that's how I feel. <laughs> tell, tell them the title and author of the book one more time. It's uh, The Last Mountain Man by William W. Johnstone. Not to be confused with uh, Preacher, The First Mountain Man, or The First Mountain Man. Uh, this is The Last Mountain Man. Uh, just simply that. And was this book reviewed this week, or is this an archive review in the Paperback Warrior site? Yeah, this is an oldie. Uh, this is one of the very first books that I reviewed on Paperback Warrior way back in uh, like 2013, I think, 2014, somewhere around there, uh, before Tom even joined the ranks here. Yes, yes. It was the BT era before me. So uh, I want to shift gears right now and talk a little bit about John D. McDonald and review a book by him called A Bullet for Cinderella. Uh, John D. McDonald is probably one of the most successful mystery authors in the history of the mystery genre. Uh, and he's from right here in Florida. Um, he began his career writing short stories for the pulp magazines. Many of those short stories have been collected up in collections called The Good Old Stuff, More Good Old Stuff. I think seven of his stories were compiled into a paperback called Seven. I haven't read any of his short stories, but I'm told they're actually very good. 
He is an icon here in Florida. If you head down to Fort Lauderdale and Lauderdale by the sea, there's like plaques up for where you know some of the fictional things happen in his novels. He's most famous for the Travis McGee series, which actually began in the 1960s. In 1964, I believe, was the first one and became the focus of his career thereafter. Uh, there were some small breaks where he wrote some standalone novels in there like Condominium. But for the most part, once he had a hit with Travis McGee, it was like Katie Bar the Door. He had a hit. And these books are still in print to this very day. And there's uh, Facebook groups out there like the Busted Flush for um, Travis McGee fans. And the Travis McGee books are great. However, I tend to gravitate toward his standalone novels. I think that um, I think they may be better. I think the best Travis McGee are probably better than his standalones. But Travis McGee went on for so long that I think after a while he kind of ran out of ideas. And I know that's controversial because he has such uh, big fans. Uh, McDonald was just perfectly placed to take advantage of the paperback boom in the 1950s. In fact, I think he's probably the Michael Jordan of the Fawcett Gold Medal uh, line of books. He he was probably Fawcett Gold Medal's most popular author. Um, and in most of his standalone novels that I enjoy uh, were written in the 1950s, maybe even the early 1960s. Anyway, so let's shift gears to Bullet for Cinderella. It was his 14th book. It was written, uh, first published in 1955, it was then re-released on Dell for some reason, and I have no idea what type of corporate shenanigans uh, made that happen. Um, and it was re-released under the name of On the Make. And I have I suspect that might have been McDonald's original title for it. Um, the title, A Bullet for Cinderella, is a bit of a spoiler in, in the novel for, for a couple reasons that I won't spoil for you here. Um, however, On the Make is just such a generic title. I, I don't know um, what the history is. But the sometimes you'll see it for a bullet for Cinderella. Most of the times you'll see that. Every now and then you'll see copies of On the Make floating around. Anyway, the book itself. It stars this guy named Talbert Howard. And it's really a treasure hunt novel. He was a POW during World I'm sorry, POW during the Korean War, who was like captured and being tortured by the Red Chinese. And while he was in the POW camp, he got to know a buddy who ended up getting killed there in the POW camp. And before his buddy was killed, his buddy said that he buried a treasure in um, in his hometown, his small American town. And he mentioned uh, when he was in kind of a, a euphoria after a beating or on his deathbed that there was a girl in the hometown named Cindy who knew about where the money was hidden. So uh, Talbot goes back to um, – when Talbot gets out, he makes a beeline over to his dead buddy's hometown to begin looking for the fortune. But he's not just digging random holes. He's looking for this girl, Cindy, and nobody there can figure out who this girl, Cindy, is. So it's very much a mystery there um, with him trying to find Cindy and then therefore try to find the fortune. The big twist is that when he arrives there, there is another POW from the same POW camp who's there in the town doing the exact same thing, basically conducting the same investigation, and it becomes clear that he is also looking for it. And the second POW was this real a-hole that nobody liked in the POW camp because he was just cruel and selfish and didn't bond together with the other guys to keep them alive. And so you have basically a good ex-POW and a bad ex-POW racing to find this fortune looking for both Cindy and the treasure. It was an absolutely terrific novel. Man, I loved it. Uh, every time I seem to read another John D. McDonald standalone novel, I'm like, okay, this is his best standalone novel. And so the folks who read the Paperback Warrior reviews of John D. McDonald's uh, novels by me will know that I'm the one who wrote it and not you because I con I'm constantly declaring that this is his best standalone novel because every one I read is better than the other. And he wrote a ton of them. So I'm really looking forward to continuing to delve into the work of John D. McDonald. I have read some of his Travis McGee books. I actually like them. Uh, they're all color coded. The green one is probably the most violent and the most Mac Bolan like. I think the blue one was the first one, and that was a great story. I also read Turquoise, which takes place in um, in the South Pacific and has a climactic scene in American Samoa. That one was great too. I have read a couple others that I started and couldn't finish because I just wasn't enjoying them. Uh, John D. McDonald has his peccadillos, and he likes to bring them out through his characters, uh, and so you could kind of tell uh, when it. 
what it is. Like one of them, he hates air conditioning and people over air conditioning. And so usually in one of his novels, there'll be some kind of rant from somebody saying how they put on too much, you know, goddamn air conditioning in this place. He also is very much against the development of kind of condominiums and taking the charm out of Florida and building it into just another generic metrop- uh, metropolis. Anyway, so that's my review of A Bullet for Cinderella by John D. McDonald. Yeah, we've got some extra time here. So when we talk about John D. McDonald, we've got – I was looking at it online here just while you were reading there. We've got uh, six reviews of his books on our uh, paperbackwarrior.com site. On the right-hand side, you can click on his name. It's one of the tags. But to uh, give you an idea, we've got Dead Low Tide, Death Trap, The End of the Night, Deadly Welcome, One Monday We Killed Them All, and Soft Touch. Um, and I would say, uh, well, this one, once it shows up, will be the seventh. But my first experience with him was One Monday We Killed Them All, which came out in uh, 1961. And the title really kind of drew me in. Have you read that one? I have not. No, I, you, you covered that one. I have it, and I think you may have actually read my copy. Yeah, you and I like these books so much that we have to send the uh, the name or the book cover to each other so we know that one's reading it, so the other doesn't. Eventually, we're going to read the same book on the same day, <laughs> and we're going to have a real Siskel and Ebert-like experience bickering over who liked it more. Yeah. Um, in fact, you you started uh, one of his most popular novels, or, or maybe the most controversial, really, is The End of the Night, which you started but didn't care too much for. I hate it. I think it was one of those books that shifts point of view pretty rapidly throughout the book, and maybe even... Refresh my memory. Was that your recollection? It is, or there were flashbacks and flash forwards. It, I found it a difficult read, but didn't Stephen King say he loved that book? Yeah, I was going to say, um, it's a 1960 uh, book. It does switch gears quite a bit between the characters. It is a violent book. Um, in fact, uh, kind of quoting from my own review online here, a uh, gritty, powerful crime novel that prefaces a turbulent time in American culture. Shockingly, the culprits, while not affluent in any sort of transcendent religious rite, exhibit psychotic tendencies that reappear just nine years later with the Manson family murders. It's not a far cry to see how the novel may have inspired horror writers like Stephen King, Jack Ketchum, and Richard Lehman. In fact, King went as far as to declare the book one of the finest novels of the 20th century. Uh, the End of the Night is uh, disturbingly fitting the mold of, of entertainment. It's an obli- I'm going to get this out here in a second. It's an obligatory read for anyone claiming to love the American crime novel. Uh, so yeah, it gets a lot of praise. Yeah, I I remember uh, the one that I keep coming back to in my mind is Dead Low Tide. Uh, it it was just so good, and there's this great character in it, who the main character, who uh, basically had a female friend with whom he had, and there's a constant sexual tension with them, who live in the same kind of cabin community on the beach together, and uh, just the relationship between those two is just amazing. Like when you have a really good and good-looking female friend, and, and it's kind of a will they, won't they type of thing, tied into a fantastic murder mystery with an absolutely repugnant villain. He actually wrote the um, the book The Executioners, which was made into the movie Cape Fear uh, twice, one with Gregory Peck and the other with Robert De Niro. That famous Max Cady character was John D. MacDonald. And uh, I love the Cape Fear movie. I haven't seen the old one, but I like the new one with Robert De Niro. But I, I, I may circle back and actually read the book because I bet it's just fantastic. Yeah, I've got a couple versions of it. It was a 1958 novel and, uh, like you said, adapted for film twice. I saw the new one, um, but I didn't see the, uh, the the original one. Gregory Peck's actually in both movies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think the uh, the newer uh, the the new Escape Fear version of it uh, had Joe Don Baker in it, uh, which was a popular uh, 70s action star. He did Walking Tall, which uh, he played uh, Sheriff Buford Pusser. Or Pucer. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, good John D. McDonald stuff on our website. Uh, we need to do a feature on him, probably. I think we just did. <laughs> yeah, we killed some time with that. <laughs> my, my review became a feature. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, I guess that's enough for uh, this episode. Look for uh, five reviews uh, this week on the site, uh, including the two we did uh, today. Um, anything else, Tom? Yeah, well, let me really quickly, since we have a minute, I'm, I'm taking a road trip and, uh, I always like, we always like to hype bookshops. I am headed out, uh, to San Antonio, Texas. And let me give you some tips. I've been to San Antonio, Texas. I go there every year for a work thing uh, for the past three years. 
And I found three bookstores there that I think are fantastic. There's a bunch of half price books in San Antonio, but I think the best of them, if you take a look at them on like a Google map, is the one in the northwest quadrant of the city. I've had the best luck there finding books. There's also a great kind of independent local bookstore there called Nine Lives Books. That's great. And um, and there's a bookstore there that's part of a chain called The Book Rack. The Book Rack's a weird little chain. Um, it's a franchise. You can pay money and get to, and you can call your bookstore the book rack. And the the franchise fee probably doesn't get you much. It gets you listed on the book rack's website. I believe it gets you an internship if you want to spend a week at someone else's book rack to see how they use it. They have a color scheme for their shelves, and they will kind of teach you how to run a used bookstore. They have a, a fun a, and all that. But other than that, um, I find most book racks that around America, and I've been to dozens of them, to be somewhat mediocre bookstores. I mean, any used bookstore is going to be about as good as whatever the trade-in is. But the book racks I've seen are mostly contemporary novels. If you want to save a couple bucks on the new James Patterson book, a book rack is going to do you fine. The exception to this is the book rack in San Antonio, Texas. Holy moly, this is an amazing used bookstore. I don't even know why he's bother, pay, bothering paying the franchise fee because it is just head and shoulders above any book rack I've ever seen. There's a man and a woman who own it. They may be husband and wife. Um, they're you know just really fans of the genre. There's a lot of classic fiction there, a lot of vintage fiction. There's a men's adventure section. There's a, um, a mystery section. And every time I go in there, I walk away with a bunch of real gems. So I will report back next episode to tell you how this particular trip to San Antonio went. But every time I've been to these three bookstores that I just mentioned, the Half Price Books, the Nine Lives Books, and the book rack in San Antonio. I always have good luck. Anyway, so that's it for this episode. Uh, You want to say goodbye to the fans? That's a wrap. All right, take it easy. Be cool. Bye-bye.